Hey there, traders. Welcome back to our Traders Roundtable today, where we have gathered three traders, myself, Christopher Ewell, Gregory Gossett, and uh, Steve Burns, to have a discussion on uh, on what's going on out in the markets. Uh, Greg, uh, if you don't mind, would you uh, please introduce yourself to the podcast so they know who we're talking to? Uh, yeah. Hi, my name is Greg Gossett uh, from Gossett Trading and Mentoring Live. I've been a full-time trader for about the last almost 25 years now. And um, uh, just really great to, uh, really glad to be here. Awesome. And Steve, tell us a little bit about who you are. Yeah, I'm uh, Steve Burns. I've uh, published several uh, books that have sold very well. And I operate uh, NewTraderU.com. Uh, I've also been trading the financial markets now for over 25 years. Oh, man. Uh, well, I am Christopher Ewell. Um, I'm the host of, of the roundtable here today and also the host of the How to Trade Stocks and Options podcast. Uh, be sure to check me out there if you haven't already. And today, um, I was really excited. I got to reach out to both Greg and, and Steve, and, and I feel exceptionally blessed to be able to call these gentlemen my friends. And we were talking about what we want to talk about for this episode. And the idea of price action, action trading came up, and then the market decided to fall apart. And I was like, holy cow, this is probably the most timely episode we could ever do on this topic. So... Uh, being that I am the uh, the least experienced of the three of us, I definitely want to learn from these two guys. And I know they've spent a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of energy learning how to do price action trading. So, uh, you know what? I'm going to hand it off to to either uh, Steve or Greg, whoever wants to take it off first, and let's let's get started down this road. I guess I'll uh, take the first uh, pitch um, for price action trading. Uh, it's really a distinct uh, method for for operating in the financial markets. You know, there's also fundamental analysis and there's technical analysis and there's also opinions and predictions. And uh, people get so far afield when they have an opinion or prediction because unfortunately the markets do not care about their opinion or prediction. The market goes where the uh, participants take it. So uh, price action trading is contrasting to fundamental analysis while an investor uh, like Warren Buffett will buy a stock because he's looking at the company and the fundamentals of the company, whether the sales will go up, whether the earnings will increase, whether the, the business is strong, whether a good competitive edge and will grow over time. He's just looking at the balance sheet. A price action trader is using uh, technical analysis and looking at the chart pattern and what the price action is telling them. Like currently the price action in the market is saying, hey, we're going into a market correction. It doesn't matter how bullish someone is on the economy or uh, any individual stock as the market has, has gone into a correction, uh, regardless of what it's driven by. Right now, it appears to be driven by a coronavirus uh, potential of a pandemic. But uh, the reason is not as important for a price action trader as the price action itself. It creates a structure where, where a price action trader has a reason to get in because moving average crossed over so it's a potential for an uptrend you know a reason to get out the, the price went below a 200 day moving average so it opens up the potential for downside so they get out you know price action gives a trader a reason why they enter why they exit you know how big the position size based on the volatility of the price action uh, where to trail a stop loss and winning trade to get out with a profit a price action trader is simply making decisions based on the chart price action and trying to create great risk reward ratios by looking at uh, price action and even the technical indicators that are derivatives of price action that's all the technical indicators are so price action is a is an arm of technical analysis but it's more reactive technical analysis uh you know what what are your thoughts on that greg yeah i mean in all the years that I've been trading, what I, you know, the point that's really been driven home to me and seeing other traders and how they've done is, you know, you need, first and foremost, you need a plan for your trading. I mean, you need a really concrete plan of where you're getting out to the downside, where you're going to get out to the upside. And you need, like you said, you need some kind of structure. And price action trading gives you those structures, it gives you those levels of where to key off, whether I'm in over this amount or over this price and I'm out under this price. But if you know, if you if you go into a trade just without a plan, you're just lost because if it goes down, uh, it never never can go down far enough for you to think, oh, it's still a good reason to hold. And if it goes up, you know, it's very important on your exits where to get out 
and you know have a defined plan of where you're going to get out. So I mean, you, you just need a plan, and price action trading gives you a concrete plan. So you're not just out there floating in the sea and just not wondering, oh, maybe is it down enough? Is it up enough? Uh, it's a hor for me at least. It's a horrible feeling to feel that way. And you know, price action trading gives you a plan. And you know, I believe the market's always right. And like Steve said, you know, your opinions they really don't matter. Uh, so uh, you know, I think it's invaluable uh, price action trading to have a plan, to have levels to key off of. Um, I would be lost without them. You know, this this topic here reminded me, I, I recently read Trend Following by Michael Covell based on Steve's recommendation. And he, in that book, I believe he says that if he were stuck on a desert island and could only have one technical indicator to trade with, he said he would just want price. And, you know, that makes so much sense to me. And, and also, uh, in another book I'd read recently, um, How I Made $2 Million in the Stock Market by Nicholas Darvish. In fact, there's a great um, companion to that that Steve put together. And, um, you know, he talks about that too, right? He was living abroad, this in incredible uh, entertainer lifestyle, and he would get a, uh, a telegraph like once a day. And he would just track, hey, is it moving up? Is it moving down? And if it's moving out of this particular, what he called a Darvis box, uh, then that would mean to him, you know, that it's a strong stock and to buy it. And, you know, when reading that, I got to thinking about how, like, how it just seems so counterintuitive. And then going back even, even further to reminiscences of a uh, stock operator, they say to, uh, you know, buy, uh, what does he say? Buy high and sell dear versus uh, uh, buy, uh, buy low and sell high, which is completely opposite, but it makes so much sense. Like Greg was just saying, you know, you're looking for a stock that has strength. You're not looking to buy a stock that, uh, you know, maybe Warren Buffett is looking at where it's been completely demolished and he's going to be riding it for the next 80 years if he can help it. Uh, so yeah, this is a uh, quite an interesting topic. And given the price action in today's markets, you know, what, what to you guys seems like a reasonable place to go? Are you guys looking to trade price action short or are you looking for things that are now becoming bullish uh, in like a uh, an inverse way to the market? Yeah, with all my research and trading over the last 25 years, I have uh, quit doing the short side of the stock market in particular. It's just spotting against the overwhelming long-term uptrend that buy and hold investors love so much. You know, the problem with short selling is, you know, the people that uh, might have made money in this drop, most of them lost so much money so many times shorting on this parabolic move mm -hmm. to the upside that, you know, they've already lost. They're, they're going to have to capture this full move to even get back what they lost with all the false short signals. Uh, I mean, especially with the last, the bull market since 2009 has been astronomical and uh, to the upside and, and incredibly difficult to catch the few short moves. I mean, when you have... You know, bull markets generally last what, about seven to nine years and generally go up three, four hundred percent, while a bear market lasts uh, six, six to months to 18 months and only goes down about 50 percent. I mean, the risk reward ratio is to the long side of the stock market in particular. I mean, you, there are there are systems for short selling. I have just not found them as robust and as profitable as the long side. And that's with 25 years of research, back testing and studies. So I prefer personally my choice to not play with the, the downside because the downside is also very volatile. You know, you might be like yesterday, you could have short sold into the market. The Dow was down 950 points at one point and then rallied all the way back up to being only down a couple hundred. So downsides are of a much bigger magnitude of volatility than the upsides. You know, the upside slow and steady and the downside uh, can have some of the biggest gap ups and rallies can happen in bear markets historically. So uh, to me, it's a very different game on the short side versus the long side, because you're also competing against the president, the Federal Reserve, the CEOs, the buy and hold investors, the long term accumulation, in the stock market, the time frames. And uh, another thing with a short side, you know, if you sell a short uh, stock short, you know, you get a $10 stock and you go short, the most you can make is $10 if it goes to zero. But it can go up to $100, so you can have a 900% or a 1,000% risk, you know, if it goes all the way up. Not that you're going to hold through all that. Some people get stubborn and do. But the <laughs> math of the upside can be multiples. The math of the downside can only be uh, going to zero. So 
the math and the trend and everything together. That's just not something I have tangled with. And believe me, I have tangled with it in 2011, 2008, uh, and uh, many other times I've tried to create back-tested systems, and it's just so much volatility. It generally chops up the, the short side in the stock market as well as uh, so many false signals where you get your signal and think, oh, it's going to go down, and then it rallies in your face for sometimes years, or like in especially the last couple of years. So the events we're seeing now and the events of uh, 2018 Christmas week are generally the outliers. Most of the time you buy the dip, you're going to do okay over long periods of time. So uh, that's what my price action in real trading time and also in back testing and research. And so many people want to catch those moves to the downside, but they're a whole different animal when you're in them. Yeah, I totally agree with Steve. I'm, I'm not a big fan of shorting. Uh, either i you know i prefer you know a, b a big part of my trading or deep dip buys uh rejections of the 30 rsi rejections of the keltner channels but mainly you know i mean like right now currently with the market i mean we're going down we're going down i mean of course it's a bit tempting to you know want to buy this dip but you know from a pure price action standpoint i need the market to tell me that it has at least stabilized tested some levels below rejected them came back up which so that's a huge part of my huge part of my trading approach is that you know lower levels have been rejected then i get in uh if it goes up great but then if those levels are breached again then you know i just hurry and get out no questions asked uh, but i think it's very important that you set levels and let the let the stock market you know let the market as a whole tell you that it you know there's less supply coming into the market there are some buyers coming into the market um, and let that price action tell you before you just jump in and buy yeah and this reminds me steve you had a twitter post recently um i forget what you said that it was something like the bears at this point are broke uh before they had a chance to to profit or something does that ring any bells yeah i remember uh people you know I, i've had people for the last i don't know how many thousands of points we went up from that big breakout like late last year and kept going up and people being bearish saying oh the very first breakout saying oh my gosh short it's a big short opportunity it's going to crash or even before that i don't know what their system was for playing it but you know when you have somebody calling us calling it to go short i mean even going back to 2009 people thinking it was going to fall 50 percent and there's you know, several even names on Twitter that uh, are been bearish uh, since I've been on Twitter. Very, mm -hmm. very bearish. Nothing but bearish. Posting bearish, saying how the market's going to crash. It's all fake. The U.S. dollar is going to implode. The uh, Fed is pumping up the system. I mean, I don't understand how you, uh, you know, and then they celebrate when it finally crashes. It's like, what world would they have been able to get in and get out and be that bearish for that long and then still be solvent enough to benefit from this crash now? After, I mean, it's just getting back to where they started to be bullish uh, five, six months ago. I mean, being bearish when they were bearish five, six months ago. So not sure how that works or how they structure that. Uh, you know, Jesse Livermore is one of the few really uh, famous short sellers that said that he made, uh, I think it was $100 billion in inflation adjusted wow. money in 1929. But he, it took him, it was over a year. He kept shorting, getting stopped out, shorting, getting stopped out, shorting, getting stopped out in the late 20s until he finally it, the market broke and they went, he went all in and uh, made a fortune but uh it's a very long process and if you're not timing it right you can go seven years and never get the crash you're looking for because like paul tudor jones in his 1987 uh you know he knew it was going to break and he was able to leverage it with s p 500 futures contracts and capture and and uh, double his, his fund's money. He had 100% return with S&P 500 future shorts. Uh, he knew it was going to break at some point, but he started it in 86. He thought it was going to break on his documentary. So, you know, that's a very difficult. I mean, people get impatient when they get stopped out of a trade in a couple of days. I mean, to be a short seller, you'd have to really uh, be ready and take who knows how many losses before you finally made it. So it takes a different psychological skill set to be able to do that. Even the legendary Chainos that has a lot of uh, short selling success, you know, he still has his biggest wins around the long side, and it still takes him long, long periods of time to get short sales. So, very, very difficult game to play, and how someone can be short and calling for a crash, and then the market goes up thousands and thousands of points in the Dow, but then they celebrate when it returns back to where it was when they started being bearish. I'm not sure how they had a strategy that didn't get stopped out, you know, 40, 50 times before they finally made some money. 
Well, maybe their strategy, because I've come across people like this, is to, you know, just sell naked calls and eventually it'll turn back around, right? I'm just going <laughs> to roll it forever. <laughs> I can imagine somebody, yeah, naked calls being exposed to all that risk. I mean, and another thing difficult with the short side is if you're doing put option, well, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, hedge my, uh, hedge my risk. I'm going to just buy a put option. So, you know, if it goes against me, I'm only going to lose the premium of the put option. But, uh, then even then, if you go in to buy the put option, the, once the VIX explodes to the upside, then you're going to have all the Vega pricing priced into the put. So it's going to cost you a huge premium to buy put option insurance, you know, when the market's already started to go down. So the put's going to be incredibly expensive if you want to play with puts only, you know, so you cap your, your risk in the price of the option. So, but then when the market eventually has that big rally to the upside, you know, a thousand, you wake up, it's 500,000 points up and the VIX gets crushed. Then your Vega value and the put option also gets crushed. So you're trying to fight against the Vega crush, sort of like you do in individual options and stocks during earnings, where after you, you, pro, you try to buy options through earnings, you're going to have to pay for the added risk of the volatility through earnings. And once the volatility event passes, then the option value gets crushed because Vega's priced out. So you have to replace the Vega value with intrinsic value in the option to make money. So that's another difficult thing is uh, put option priced in uh, Vega during uh, downtrends. So, Greg, tell me what you're looking at whenever you're working on your, uh, well, for the audience out there, Greg has his own show that he does every single day in the last hour of the market. And he goes through and talks about trader psychology and talks about the trades that he's looking at and, and executes trades as well. And I've tuned in many times. I know Steve does as well. And it's very educational. And it's really great to hear uh, someone else's thoughts and, and even to hear um, what he's trading because um, I had emailed Greg while we were getting set up for this and said, Greg, you're looking at um, Merck and you're looking at at and I also just traded those over the last couple of weeks. So I thought that was pretty interesting that uh, he and I were looking at the, the same thing. But Greg, what, what are you looking at right now during your show? Because, uh, you know, if we're in this correction right now, potentially looking at a bear market and maybe you have a, a portfolio where you're not really looking to short stocks, what are you doing these days? Well... <clears throat> You know, I mean, the market goes up, it goes sideways, it goes down. And, uh, you know, I have four or five different setup approaches, uh, you know, to take advantage of whatever the market's doing. But uh, currently right now, I mean, you know, we're obviously we're going down. We've had a huge sell off. Uh, like I said before, you know, I'm looking for levels that hold below here. Right. And if 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 they hold, uh, if they go down to those levels, if they bounce, if I get certain signals uh, where it rejects further downside movement, then I think, OK, well, the way that I look at it is that, you know, there were no more sellers down at that level, but I don't anticipate it. I just wait until those prices are rejected. Then I get in play for a bounce uh, in this type of market with these dip, with these dips uh, deep the deep dip situation we have going on. Uh, but like I said, I don't anticipate it. I just wait until it happens. I get in, put my trade on. I'm either going to be right or I'm going to be wrong. Uh, if I'm wrong, hopefully I'm going to be, be wrong small compared to how much I could make to the upside. So I'm just trying to be patient. Let the market tell me that certain levels below are holding and therefore hopefully a bounce. And if not, I just sit on my hands. But, you know, uh, I think a lot of traders know this. They've heard this from many, many different people, the books they've read, so forth and so on. But, um, you know, with with the show, with my show each day, Gossip Trading and Mentoring Live, you know, I spend a lot of time uh, talking about trader psychology because, you know, learning uh, support and resistance levels, entries, indicators, uh, these are important things. And, uh, you know, I've learned so much from Steve Burns and his books and some of my other mentors and traders. Uh, but just because uh, you, you know how to trade, just maybe you're a good uh, ch uh, chart analyst, good technical analyst, uh, but putting together a plan with support and resistance and indicators and so forth is very important. But in my opinion, the biggest skill that you can, after, after you learn that, the biggest skill that you can learn is uh, discipline and trader psychology. And if you find yourself 
not following the plan or the rules that you set up, then you really have some work to do psychologically on yourself to be able to follow that plan. You can have the best plan in the in the world. You can have the best setup in the world, but you know if you're not able to follow it, um, keep the discipline, then there's no there's no use having it. So in a market like this, you know, yes, have a plan, look for support, look for rejection, look for levels holding. Uh, but uh, the most important part of trading in, after that, in my opinion, is the discipline uh, of being able to follow that plan. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this, Greg. So, um, oh man, I, I totally went blank. <laughs> That's embarrassing. <laughs> um, well, yeah. So, so you're talking about having a plan. Oh, here it is. Uh, do you have a plan if the market, like the SPY, is below the 50-day or the 20-day or anything like that? Does that have a bearing on how you trade individual stocks? Because for me, I have like a macro level, right? And I know that like the Cam Slim uh, methodology there, uh, developed by William O'Neill, uh, talks about the market being one of his criteria before entering a stock, right? If it's above the 50-day, then he's likely to go long. Uh, do you also factor that into whenever you're looking to place a trade? Well, yeah, I use moving averages a lot. Um, uh, I use them a lot. I use them as uh, support underneath me. You know, I, I again, it, I look at them as levels, and um, you know, it would depend on the context of the chart and the setup of the chart. But yeah, you know, those are my kind of uh, that's my line in the sand. If it's above, if it stays above this moving average, I'm in. Be patient with it to the upside. If it closes below that particular moving average, uh, I may not want to get out, but that's my signal, right? So yes, I mean, I, I use moving averages as levels. I use RSIs as levels, um, you know, and then different entry techniques and so forth. But yes, you know, and you know, I've, I've learned so much of this over the years from Steve Burns, especially his book, Moving Averages 101. But yes, you know, I, I use them as trend lines. I use them as support lines, St you know, green light, stay in above, red light, get out below. <clears throat> and of course, you know, it depends on the context. I always, you know, I, but ideally I look for confluence of indicators like, okay, there's a 50 RSI here and there's a 20 day moving average here. Well, the way that I look at that uh, is that I look at that as so two levels of support underneath me. But if we lose two levels of support, I'm just going to go ahead and get out. But, you know, trading uh, is about risk to reward, getting out quickly if you're wrong, having the patience to stay in if you're right. Uh, you know, I look for a confluence of indicators. You know, I say this every day on my podcast, but, you know, I, I look at each uh, indicators such as moving averages and RSI and so forth. I, I look at these, when I look at the chart, not so much as just lines on the chart or numbers on the chart, but I look at them as different groups of buyers. And, you know, you can dramatically increase the, your chances of having a profitable trade if you're in with as many other groups or uh, with as many other people as possible, with uh, as many other buyers as possible. So I look at indicators as different groups of buyers. If I know that the more buyers I have, the better chance of a trade I have, then I look for a confluence of these indicators lining up. So, you know, if the RSI is one group of buyers and a moving average is another group of buyers, then if those two come together at the same place, same time on this time frame on this chart, then I look at those as, hey, I have two groups of buyers with me. And again, you know, uh, you know, it's common sense, but uh, if there are no group, if there are no buyers around you, the price is probably not going to go up. It's probably going to go down until it hits another level level where there are buyers. So, uh, yes, I, I definitely use those as stops underneath me. I just look at those support. I look for confluence of indicators, and uh, so yeah, that's how that's how I approach trading. You know the the idea of buying low and selling high. Um, that's that's the opposite of what you're talking about there, right? where you, you need to have certain groups that are already buying. <laughs> You're not trying to be the first one buying. Uh, that, that, you know, that, that, that's a hard thing for a new trader to, to overcome. And you, know, you talked about uh, following your plan. Uh, the last time we were on, I, I had talked about how, um, for me, sometimes following my plan was hard. And it, it 
probably is for a lot of traders because you know you're, you're seeing one thing and you know you're seeing it go against you that's not part of the plan i i, I don't want it to be a loser but what i found that works really well for me is uh having stops automatic stop orders and so like if uh if i'm using trend spider and my alert gets hit that it crossed this moving average or whatever i'm going in i'm adjusting my stop by like a couple pennies and i'm like okay i know that i have a hard time going in and 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 doing the order on my own but if the stop is in there and it does it for me then it's so much easier like earlier this week i uh, i tried to short pfizer and um i put it in i had all my alerts set up i'm all ready to go and like 30 minutes later, it was stopped out. And I was like, ah, oh, dude, this sucks. <laughs> but then I come and look at it later in the day and it's up a dollar. And I'm like, oh, well, that, that was a good thing, actually. Now you feel so better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm a huge believer in stops. And it, it took me forever to come to that point because uh, where I started trading from, it was kind of the opposite. Where it was, hey, you know, you're going to put on, you know, option spreads and, uh, you know, you're just going to let probabilities play out and all that stuff. And and honestly, that that didn't work for me. So I, I went on my own personal journey to try and find something that did work better for me. And, and you know, thanks to people like you and Steve, um, it's gotten a lot easier, especially being able to stomach a, a tiny loss versus, you know, now hoping and praying that it goes around and uh, everything else that could happen when a, when a trade goes sideways. Yeah, it comes, it comes back to having a plan and losses are just part of trading and you have mm -hmm. to, you know, they're just a cost of doing business. They're your cost of goods in trading. And, uh, you know, no one wants to get stopped out. It doesn't feel good. It hurts our ego and so forth. But, you know, if you, if you can just get past that, keep your losses small, have the courage to stick with the trade uh, on the upside, I think think you're going to do just fine. But again, it, it comes back to having that plan and sticking with it. I mean, you know, there's some really smart people out there, great uh, technical analysts, uh, but, uh, you know, probably the weak spot in their game is not being able to follow their plan. I, I can't remember. I think, I, I don't know if it was Michael Covell's book or I was reading about the turtle traders. And of course, most of you probably know about the turtle traders. Uh, you know, they hired, you know, people without experience in the market. They, they coached them up on their approach. And uh, I believe one of the original turtles in an interview said, uh, you know, if I would have just had a, you know, just a, a carpenter or a taxi cab driver, if I would have just had him trade my account for the last 20 years, I would have made, uh, you know, twice as much money as compared to what I made, even though I know a lot more, because I told him the plan, he followed the plan, he didn't have any, uh, um, he didn't have a, a dog in the fight, so to say, and so he just followed the plan. And I, I think a lot of people honestly would benefit if they, you know, they hired a uh, 18 year old and said, here's my plan, please just follow it to the letter, follow it to the T. I, I have a feeling they would do better than the person that was a really good analyst that couldn't follow their plan. It's really fascinating when you're, you're, you're different parts of a trader. You're a researcher, you're an analysis, you're a technical analysis, you study charts, you're a chart reader, uh, you know, you're a, a student, you're reading books, you're learning. There's all kinds of different facets of being a trader. Uh, but like Greg said, when you go into actually putting real money to risk and on the line, it can trigger emotions of uh, greed and fear and ego and uh, it's a whole different ball game. Sort of like if you're, it's different between shooting at target practice and then having a duel with somebody. It's a different ball game when you're shooting at yeah. the target, and the target has no weapon, but it, you're facing somebody down, and you both have guns aimed at each other. Totally different ball game as a police and military uh, know when it's real life action taking place. It's crazy how stressed out and emotional, especially new traders, can get when they see money. Uh, start uh, leaving their account and then they have the kick in. They want to be right. They want to prove it right. Oh, it just has to bounce back. I mean, all the errors, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, I've heard recently people calling me about their 401ks being just wiped out with annual returns overnight and how that triggers normal people, you know, like people walking around and somebody take a thousand dollars out of their pocket and take it. You know, that's a very emotional experience for most people. And the trader has to develop the skill of execution, sort of like a surgeon can go in and operate on somebody and be a professional and be unattached and just execute a process 
And like Greg said, it's a whole different ballgame. It is incredible to me how somebody – I know people that have been studying the market and trading for years and have still never opened up a actual live system with real money at risk. So part of the trading of price action is you know being able to execute a system with discipline and be able to think of the money as points and be emotionally and e egotistically detached from your trading – you know, you will feel you will feel the emotions will come in, but it's how you react to them and how you manage them, and how you deal with them. And when you get to a place where you just let the emotions pass over you and you know you're a professional and you think through the process, let your mind be in charge. And um, and like uh, Greg said, just follow the process and uh, you're going to have drawdowns. You're going to have losses. You know, if you didn't, you'd be a billionaire with <laughs> compounding pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's just the reality. But yeah, the trader is a different skill set than back tester or researcher or opinion guy or talking head. Totally different skill sets when the price action starts moving against you. 100%. I mean, perf perfectly said. It's like, you know, some there's some great basketball players, but maybe they're not great coaches. You know, there's some great coaches, but maybe they're not the, the best basketball player. So, it's one thing to know it. It's another thing to execute it. And uh, I mean, trading is the great game. You know, when somebody asked me if you're a trader, you know, I don't think they quite understand how all encompassing it is, you know, mentally and physically and spiritually. I mean, it, 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 it encompasses everything. And I think that's why so few people can do well at it because they have a, they have a weakness in their game. So it's, uh, you have to work on all all aspects of it and you know my advice this I, I think what it really comes down to as far as what Steve was saying with those emotions being turned up uh, with real money and so forth uh, I, 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 I I think that the my best piece of advice is position size if you position size conservatively can can uh, position size uh, to a point with, with, with the amount of shares or futures contracts or whatever you're buying that if it's a small position size, you don't get those uh, emotions turned up and that will help you stick with your plan probably more than anything. Because at the end of the day, you, you only have control of two things in this market. One, when you buy something or sell something and number two, what your position size is. And if the position size is too large, you're not acclimated to that, con the, to that position size, uh, it, you're going to, you're probably not going to follow your plan because your emotions are going to get best of you. So, you know, position sizing conservatively small where it's meaningful, but it, it's not going to, where you can stay with your plan and then get acclimated to that. So you're used to it and then maybe go up a little bit and then get acclimated with that and so forth and so on. So how do you determine the size that, um, well, obviously, we all have our own our own risk tolerances there, and you know you've heard uh, lots of different experts and gurus and people like Steve and and you go out there and talk about how you risk maybe one percent or two percent of your position or of your uh, of your account in each position, and that way you know you could have a hundred losers in a row, and that would finally take you out, and the likelihood of that is pretty pretty unlikely, but. How do you guys keep that on to where it's meaningful enough to want to trade versus being so small that it, it fits in your emotions, but then it also becomes boring and doesn't really um, seem like there's enough reward to justify even putting it on? Yeah, it's, it's like position sizing, like a volume knob on your emotions. You have to start what you can handle regardless of what it means. It's meaningful, you know. One person might trade 50 bucks. One person might do $100. You know, one work your way up to $1,000 in risk. Uh, you know, but the, the first part of that is your account size. You know, you have to have enough money to even make it worth meaning, like you said. If you have a $30,000 account and you can uh, – you know, put on a $3,000 position size. And if it goes up 10% in your favor and you make $300, that could be something for you. It means something and that could be a great place to start. But you have to have enough money to make it worth your trouble. With free commissions, it makes it a little easier now. And with uh, trading liquid markets with tight bid ask spreads, you know, makes it less risky with smaller accounts. But you have to start with enough capital to make it meaningful. And you have to start with what you can emotionally handle and then work your way up from there. Uh, position sizing for me... You know, 10% is a good default position sizing. If you have something that has potential to go up 10%, that's a 1% gain. 
And uh, if you go, if it goes down 10%, it's a 1% loss. You know, something less volatile like SPY, you know, you could, you could go up to 100% if you have a smaller account. You know, SPY is generally not going to move 1% against you in a day. Uh, well, unless it's last week. <laughs> <laughs> unless, unless it's 2020 or after. But, uh, you know, you have to, you know, have your, have your, plan on you know what could what could be my position size how much can this move and how much will i lose and that's the one side you know if you're doing 10 percent position size and you're trying to get 10 percent gains to make one percent one percent returns to your total capital then you want to have stop losses around three percent you know you don't want to lose a full one percent if you're going to only risk to gain one percent you want to risk losing you know a third of a percent or a quarter of a percent so you know if you're like uh, william o'neill says you know if you're trying if you're going to have a stop loss on an individual stock at six percent or seven percent then you want your winners to be about 18 percent or tw or uh, 21 percent you know you want your winners to be about three times the size of your losers so you have to have the potential so if you're risking one percent then you don't want to lose if you're trying to gain 1%, then you don't want to risk more than a third of a percent. If you're trying to gain uh, 3%, you know, if you're trading like <laughs> Virgin Galactic or Beyond Meat, you know, you're trying or Tesla, and you're trying to get a 30% gain, then you could risk losing 10%. So, you know, a 10% position size. And people get very confused where they think, uh, you know, they, they think 1% risk is 1% position size. You know, if you have a $100,000 account, you know, you're not trading $1,000 in position size. You're trading $10,000 in position size, but you don't want to lose 1% uh, of total trading capital. So your stop loss would have to be 10% of the move of the stock of the 10% position size, which that can get people all tangled up just trying to think through all the different math. Right. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, you could trade 20% position sizes in, you know, like the QQQ, or you, you could get bigger position size if you're trading a less volatile asset. But if you're trading like options, if you're buying options, then you might only have a position size of 1% because it might be an all or nothing bet and an option could go up 100% or 200% or go down to zero. So, you know, you'd want an option that would have the chance to go up 300% if you're going to risk losing the whole price of the option. You know, so if you lose, you're down 1%. If it triples, you're up 3% in your trading account. Uh, I could have got some people tangled up in that, but I hope you see, see the foundation of that where you start with your risk. But you want your reward to be at least two to three times more than you're risking, or it's not even worth the risk. Yeah, that makes sense. So, Greg, do you think that it's better off to go bigger size and tighter stop or longer stop and smaller size? Hmm. Well, <clears throat> I think it's personal. I, I think it depends on what kind of trader you are. And <clears throat> again, what's going to help you follow your plan, which, you know, what can you handle your emotions? I, I you know, kind of what Steve was talking about there, like with the 10% rule, which is, you know, basically what I use. I have a couple different filters on there, but as a beginning trader, I, I don't think profits are that important. I, I, I think using a very small position size, which Will, will keep you in the game, which will let you understand that your setup works over time is much more important initially than making money. And because I think a lot of traders start out, of course, they want to make money right away. But again, it, it gets back to tuning up those emotions and amplifying those emotions. Um, I, I just think, you know, you, you should crawl before you walk and run and use a very small position size so that you can stay in the game because a lot of people, you know, such a large percentage of people bust out of this market. And it's because they use too large of a position size. They never got the experience of trading for a long time. And, you know, you, you, the only way you get experience is by doing something. And, and if you blow up your account, you can't do something. You, you'd never get experience. So uh, I think it's personal. You know, uh, I, I think both approaches would be fine and work as long as either of those approaches kind of gel with you as a person. But if you use a large position, a larger position size and have a smaller stop, um, I guess it's okay as long as you adhere to that stop. But a lot of people, once it goes through that stop, they won't get out and they hold on to it and it just keeps going down. Um, I think somewhere in the middle is probably the best. I mean, I like to I like to enter my positions just as close as I can 
to my support underneath me, but I don't really vary my position size. I, I want to just be in this for the long run. You know, I want to be a casino dealing cards or rolling that roulette wheel. Uh, you know, you go, you go to Vegas and you, you see these tables, they have limits on there and you know, the limits are for the casinos protection. They're very aware of position size. You know, you're not going to go walking into a casino and place a half a half a billion dollar bet. They have the advantage, but still it's too much of a risk for them. So I think it's just personal. Everybody's different. Uh, I just think you have to find a plan that's going to work for you. I don't know, Steve, what, what's your opinion on that? The larger stop, shorter stop, or closer stop? Uh, it's interesting that I, you know, especially my younger, when I had a smaller account, I was trying to build it and build it and build it. I would do large position size with, with tight stop losses. So if it went in my favor, I had the chance of getting a big gain, but that worked against me as well. I mean, I had some phenomenal gains in years, but I also had some phenomenal drawdowns, especially like right now with a big position held overnight in the stock market, you're going to get killed on the gap downs against you. So I have uh, definitely evolved into smaller position sizes now. You know, about the biggest thing I take now is about a 20% position size in my IRA on a uh, index ETF like a Aspire or QQQ. I prefer to, you know, if I'm going to be all in the stock market in my retirement IRA account, I'm going to be in 20% Qs, 20% SPY, uh, 20% small caps, you know, just to get a little bit of diversification in, in capitalization of stocks, even though I feel safe, you know, going up to high amounts of exposure and equities. Uh, you know, I definitely am, am a proponent now of smaller position size. I was able to trade Beyond Meat and uh, Virgin Galactic uh, this year because I had a 10% and a 5% position size. I don't think I could have traded Virgin Galactic with, with more than a 5% position size because of the, the size of the movement. So, uh, I, I, you know, what my parameters now is I go for about 10% position size in trading, uh, I try to keep my losses two to three percent. I try to have the biggest gains be six to ten percent, uh, two for one or three for one risk reward ratio, and that has worked out really well with profitability in the last several years as I've shifted to that long only, you know, buying dips, buying momentum signals, breakouts to the upside with price action, where I really just focus on no single position really in, in emotionally engages me that much. You know, 10% position size, even with the gap downs overnight, you know, having uh, the SPY overnight trade, it's really almost made me yawn, you know, even if it's down, <laughs> SPY's down uh, 3%, and I'm long with my overnight 10% trade, I'm down 0.3%, about a third of a percent. So it's, uh, it's not even been, you know, I've had about a, a little bit over 1% drawdown this week, but it almost makes me happy versus what the rest of the market has done. I'm still positive for February. But I think the key, though, is the exposure. You know, as the market's going up and up in a bull market and you start getting hit, you know, you come out of like the Christmas of 2018 crash as I started getting momentum signals and triggering me to get back in. I got longer and longer and longer and end up with, uh, you know, a lot of positions as it got longer, then slowly got hit with profit targets and trailing stops and so it took me out. So you also can look at the amount of positions you have. You know, if the market's an uptrend, you want to have four, five, six, seven positions on the long side and then and then you want as it starts reversing you want to go down to less and less risk exposure so overall risk exposure is another important component where you want to be as long as possible during uptrends and be in, in as cash as much as possible as the market starts to break down that also helps your performance dr dramatically that's the biggest edge that a, a swinger trend trader has versus a buy and hold investor is their exposure is uh, is heavy during the upswings and is limited during the downswings yeah, and you know, just to to start wrapping this up, one thing I, I found in Covell's book that I, I thought was really interesting in, in trend following is he was talking about how, you know, when you have moving average signals or price action trading, like we're talking about, you don't have to predict the future. You're just trading on what the market is giving you today. Kind of like Greg was talking about earlier. You know, you can have your own opinion, but don't trade your opinion. And over the last week. Uh, I had been getting fewer and fewer signals to to stay in. In fact, I was getting more and more signals that uh, to get out or to go short. And I texted Steve and I was like, Steve, are you seeing this too? And, uh, you know, by I guess it was two days before the market really started dropping the four, five and six percent days. I was already all in cash. And then here it comes. And it's exactly like, um, you know, Covell was saying it was exactly like uh, Nicholas Darvis was saying in his book, you know, if it starts breaking down, it starts going back into a lower priced box like a Darvis box. 
um, you know, that's that's your signal that things are changing, right? And and not to fight that, but to uh, to start adapting to the new new environment that we're coming into. So I, I'm really interested, uh, you know, as we come to the close here, what are you guys looking at uh, right now? Is it, um, and by the time this airs, you know, that'll that'll be long gone. <laughs> but, uh, you know, are, are you looking at anything in particular for a, a, a bounce or are you looking at maybe some long commodities or, or what what's on y'all's radar? Uh, well, generally, the market, uh, you know, does rebound, even if this is a true going into a, a correction of 20 percent. You know, the market generally bounces at pullbacks of 5 percent, corrections of 10 percent, bear market plunges of 20 percent. Those generally create levels of even short term bounces. So I'm looking to try to bounce back into out of oversold territory and back over the 200 day short term. You know, right now we're, we've sunk way below 30 RSIs, which is a huge oversold indicator on the daily chart, as well as dropped tr dramatically below 200 day moving averages. I'm looking for the strongest relative strength for uh, stocks like maybe Facebook gets back over a 250 day moving average or uh, the strongest names on my watch list that are the first to break back over the 30 RSI or back over the 200-day uh, moving average is what I'm looking for, an emergence out of this oversold territory to revert somewhat to the mean in the short term is what I'm looking at. What are you looking at, uh, Greg? <clears throat> yeah, same thing. I'm, look, I'm looking for some level to hold down here. I'm looking, I'm looking for a level that the market goes under and says, ah, we don't like it down there. There's not enough sellers down there. We're going back up. Um, uh, but you know, whether it's a 30 RSI or the 250 day moving average or the 200 day moving average, or, you know, whatever indicators you use, um, I'm looking for, I'm looking for a bounce here. Now, I don't think that if it bounces, okay, that's the bottom and we're going back up. Uh, you know, of course I don't know that, but you know, I'm looking for a bounce. I'm looking for, you know, if it works out, I'm looking for a rejection above, <clears throat> I'm looking for some kind of trailing stop. Um, you know, and I'll, uh, stick with it as long as it keeps moving up. But if it reverses, I'll come back down. But, you know, there's always levels, you know, down below us, whether they're RSI or moving averages or Keltner channels uh, that get rejected and say, okay, we've gone down far enough. So, yeah, I, I'm looking for bounces right now. And ideally in, in, like Steve said, you know, in the best and the strongest stocks. Perfect. Well, guys, I got to tell you, if the audience out there hasn't already filled up three notepads worth of, just gold that you guys have given them. Um, they're doing themselves a disservice and they should rewind this <laughs> and listen again. Because, you know, I, I love having the podcast. I love being able to to connect with people like you guys. And a lot of people really honestly, like for the fact that Greg puts on a show every single day, Greg's a professional trader and you can listen in on what he's doing every day. Like the amount of value that you guys give away is 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 huge and that's why i say i hope the audience out there really goes back takes a lot of notes on this because to be able to pick the brains like 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 we have on this show here man that that's so so incredibly useful to you and it, it could literally help you the rest of your life if you put some of these uh nuggets into practice going forward so i really want to say thank you guys for coming on and, and sharing all this knowledge and wisdom that you have today I always enjoy talking to both of you, Chris and Greg. I do too. And thank you for having me on, uh, Chris. And thank you so much for doing these podcasts and all the content you put on your channel. Well, you know, it's it's my pleasure. I I, I was just thinking about this the other day. You know, I, I feel so fortunate not only to connect with you guys, to, but to be able to share my passions. Because this is, you know, I, this is what I, I, I live and breathe. And I'm sure you guys are the same way. So make sure you are out there and you go check out Greg's channel on YouTube, Gossip Trading and Mentoring Live. He has a show every single market day at the uh, last hour before the close. And be sure to buy all of Steve's books on Amazon. Uh, he would appreciate that very much. <laughs> but in all reality, thank you guys for tuning in to this Traders Roundtable. Um, I really hope that you had a, a great opportunity to, to learn from these guys and you know what? I can't wait to have them on again in the near future. So thank you two for coming on today. Well, thanks for having us, Chris. Thank you. Appreciate it, Chris. Very good. U.S. government required disclaimer. Stock, options, futures, and forex trading is not appropriate for everyone. While there is a potential for large rewards, there is also a substantial risk of loss associated with trading. 
The material in this video or live broadcast is not geared towards any particular individual or to any particular financial situation and is not intended to meet the particular investment objectives of any viewer. This video or live broadcast, like all instructional materials produced by Gossett Trading and Mentoring LLC, is created and published for informational and educational purposes only. Any and all information contained in, implied, or referenced by this video or live broadcast is not to be construed as investment advice, and no representation is made that any individual or entity involved in production of this video or live broadcast is an investment or financial advisor or is registered or authorized to give any financial advice. We are publishers and educators only. Therefore, the various producers of this video or live broadcast will not accept liability for any loss or damage of any kind, which may arise either directly or indirectly out of the use of any of this material, including any loss of profit. No representation is made that any account or investment will or is likely to achieve the profit or losses demonstrated. We recommend consultation with a licensed and qualified professional before making any investment decision. This video or live broadcast is not to be construed as an offer to buy or sell any security, financial instrument, or financial product of any kind. Notice is hereby given that any individual or entity involved in production of this video or live broadcast or their clients may have an interest in any security, financial instrument, or financial product mentioned or referenced. Any simulated or hypothetical performance result depicted does not represent actual trading and therefore may under or overcompensate for the impact of various market factors such as lack of liquidity. Thank you.